So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to the 2024 uh, UCL NeuroPixels course. Um, I'm Matteo Carandini, and I'm going to give a brief introduction to the past and future of NeuroPixels. Before I give my introduction, however, I want to give you a little overview of the course. Um, here's the website of the course. You can just Google NeuroPixels UCL course and you'll find it. Um, and um, the, the course goes over three days. Um, the organizers are listed here. I'm listed there, but the real organizers are Annie and Celian, who you probably, you might see on your screens. I don't know, you will see them soon if not. And, uh, and my task, as I said, is to give you a brief introduction. Um, so as you probably know, NeuroPixels were developed to solve a problem in neuroscience, which was the difficulty that there was in recording from lots of neurons uh, at the same time. And uh, the state of the art before NeuroPixels were developed were these polytrodes um, where you can see lots of recording sites. But you can also see that by, uh, by the time you go up on the shank of the electrode, most of the space is taken up by wires, which is, by the way, also true for our spinal cord. Um, and so, so the wires were being produced using technologies that, that, uh, of the time, but they were not the most advanced technologies that were present in chips, in uh, semiconductor chips. So NeuroPixel solved this problem um, in, a, in about 2017 uh, by starting to use technology that was, um, the, you know, semiconductor industry technology. And this led to a massive increase in the number of simultaneous recording sites in a single shank in the brain. So this is what a NeuroPixels probe looks like. Um, it's typically one centimeter long, unless you're using the version for primates. It has about a thousand sites, more than 960 these days. And but what's amazing is that what comes out is already fully amplified and digitized. So in principle, you don't need a lab. You just could, in principle, plug this straight into a laptop. Um, in, pr in practice, you can't because it doesn't speak USB or Firewire or some other language that a laptop would understand. Um, but one of the reasons why this was, uh, and by the way, these numbers here, 12,700, are two years old. So, um, so I'm sure that now there's way more labs um, and, and more, way more probes. Uh, one of the things that really made these probes uh, transformational was the ability to record not only from one place in the brain, but in many places of the brain at the same time. Here's an experiment where um, we inserted two probes at the same time. And here is a uh, here's an illustration of a study by Nick Steinmetz where he typically inserted two or three probes at a time in multiple mice. So this allows you unprecedented uh, coverage of the brain. So the probe I showed you in the previous picture was the probe that first came out. It's called the 1.0 probe. Um, and just to give you an idea of how, you know, of the process, um, here is a process by which that probe was um, produced. Uh, the publication I showed you was from 2017, and about a couple of years later, the probe was released uh, at cost uh, to the public. Um, and, uh, and then a similar process was followed uh, su subsequently to produce the 2.0 probes. Um, these probes are essentially, they cost more money than would be feasible for a for a for-profit company to make to make back their investment. Um, they cost on the order of five million euros to develop, um, and so they're produced with the thanks to foundations that that give money. Um, the first one was done by Howard Hughes, Wellcome Trust, Allen Institute, and a consortium of others. Um, the second one also by a similar consortium. Um, and then they are sold at cost price uh, by a non-profit semiconductor company called IMAC in Belgium. So these are the two main kinds of probes that we have, the 1.0s and the 2.0s. Um, the, 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 the thing that really changed with the 2.0s is having more sites, but mostly having four shanks and a few other differences, which means that now you can have four shanks with 1,200 sites at the same time in the brain. Also, the arrangement of the sites became linear, which allowed for motion correction, which was very useful. And also, allowing, motion, allowing for motion correction um, allowed us to record from the same neurons for long periods in the, in the brain. This is illustrated here. Um, sorry, here, this is about neuron stability. 
uh, how many uh, neurons are kept after implantation. Um, but then the question would, would be how many of those neurons are actually the same neurons? And here is a study where we um, measured the visual responses of neurons in the visual cortex and found that, as, as expected, some neurons like some images, some neurons like some other images. Uh, but we also found that the responses, this, the signature of the neurons were, was very conserved across days. And so we could track the same neurons over um, uh, up to 60 days or even more in more recent work that Annie and Celian have published. Um, by the way, this is something that even if you're not interested in doing, uh, this thing is interested in you, meaning if you record chronically, there is a chance that even if you don't want to, you're recording from the same neurons all the time. So you shouldn't count these as independent measurements. And you may want to know what the neurons do across days. So here is a very brief overview of the NeuroPixels probes that are uh, available and under development. And, um, and, and so in green are the ones that you can go now to buy at neuropixels.org. In yellow is one that you can buy uh, as part of a special order. Uh, and in red are the ones that are being developed. So I already told you about the 1.0 and the 2.0. There's a third version called the 3. Well, it's currently called NXT, but it will be called 3.0 when it comes out, which uses the next generation of semiconductor technology. So instead of having so-called wires that are about 180 nanometers, uh, it will have um, wires that are about 45 nanometers, which is still, by the way, way larger than what's in your mobile phone which is down now to 1.5 nanometers, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but, uh, you know, your mobile phones make a lot of heat, and we don't want these probes to make a lot of heat, and we want a high signal to noise. Other versions that are available are these Ultra, which have high density, but of, of course at the, pro at the cost of a smaller um, uh, area of recording, and these might allow you to find some very small neurons or some accents that you wouldn't find otherwise. The NHP version, which has been put in non-human primates and in humans, um, is five centimeter long and is sterilized as you want for that kind of uh, application. And now I'll tell you a little bit about the opto version, which should be available in 2028 and we're developing now. And the opto version is a probe that uh, will emit light in two wavelengths, red and blue, in addition to recording from uh, electrophysiologically. Um, I'll give you just one example in the next slide. Uh, of course, the, the, the goal here is to be able to do optogenetics in addition to uh, electrophysiology. Um, and here is an example with a recording done by Carolina Soja in our lab, uh, where she's recording with a NeuroPixels probe uh, vertically, inserted vertically through visual cortex. And these are the responses of a bunch of neurons when she does visual stimulation through the eyes of a mouse. Um, then she has a laser um, out uh, on top of the cortex and she illuminates the cortex and because this mouse expresses a red uh, sensitive opsin, you see this in excitatory neurons, you see these activations of these neurons uh, in visual cortex but not in hippocampus where there is no opsin. This might have been a virus injection by the way, I, I don't remember. Uh, otherwise, I don't know how there would be no opsin in hippocampus. I think this was a virus injection. And then she tested this ability of the opto probes to emit red light at these different uh, levels. And so when she emits light in the, in the hippocampus, she sees nothing. But as she starts emitting light in different sites of different layers of the visual cortex, she, she's able to activate neurons there. So this is something that we're hoping to deliver in 2028. Sorry, it's in four years, but it takes a long time for these semiconductor industry cycles to complete. Now I'm going to move on. Instead of talking about NeuroPixels Opto, I'll briefly talk about you. So who are you who are joining this course? Um, you are mostly PhD students. That's in orange here. You're slightly more male than female. Uh, you come from a bunch of places, uh, US, a lot of Europe, um, and other places, including India and China and Japan. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that none of you come below uh, the zero latitude, um, and it would be great if one day we had an even more diverse, um, um, uh, you know, group of people here. Um, but uh, but you don't work in such a diverse place. You tend to work in fewer countries. Uh, this is where you're from, but this is where you work. 
Um, most of many of you, uh, the biggest group are in the United States, so it's very early in the morning for you. Thank you for waking up. Um, a few of you stayed in China, but more of you came from China, so not, not so many of you are uh, up late at night, although quite a few of you are in India, so thank you for staying up late at night. And quite a few are in Japan, so if you're up awake now, you know, congratulations. Um, you have mostly no NeuroPixels experience. You seem to be interested in equal parts in acute and chronic um, recordings. Um, ideally, you want to recover the probes afterwards, and uh, that's a good idea, and we'll tell you much more. So to close up, uh, this is just the beginning of three days of presentations. Uh, the first two days are introductory, um, and the third day uh, goes in depth into some hot topics of the moment. I believe Celian will say a few words about this, but your way to contribute to the conversation is to use the Q&A button. Is that correct, Celian? Yeah? Yeah, okay. And upvote some questions that you find interesting. Um, and, but if time is short and we don't get to answer questions, consider using the appropriate Slack channels. And one last word, at the end of the course, all of the lectures, um, except for potentially some sensitive material, uh, appear on YouTube uh, forever for anybody to look at when they're interested. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll uh, give the word to the two organizers.